Well, back on January the 19th of this year, a, re a, a very significant event happened in my life. I worked for the last time. January the 19th was my last day of employment after about 50 and a half years of continuous service in pastoral ministry. And from that point on, I became officially retired. Now, I want you to focus on that word, retired. Because I found the fact that I was retired opened me up for all kinds of sarcastic observations, such as, well, now that you've got all this time on your hands, what are you going to do? And of course, somebody was always brilliant enough to propose what they thought I ought to do with my time now that I was retired. However, I have found that um, in many ways, um, I don't know how much I actually gave up from pastoring in the Sacramento Church. You see, the young man I turned it over to seemed to be very clever in trying to get me to do most of the things I was doing before. And I still found myself editing videos and logging all the donations, and I found myself still on the speaking schedule, still on the worship leading schedule, still hosting senior Bible studies, still giving ch uh, children stories, and the list goes on. And I looked at him one day and I said, and what just are you doing with your time during the day? <laughs> well, a little fun at his expense. But I will have to say, especially during the week, I am pretty much footloose and fancy free. I've been blessed with a wife who does not dream up many honeydew points on my list. You know, honeydew this and honeydew that. So I get away with that pretty good. And I find myself having time to just, I don't, I don't want to say do nothing, but try to get a feel for a little bit of relaxation, a little bit of solitude, a little bit of sitting in my chair in the backyard, looking at the beautiful scenery, which I'll talk about in a minute, and just being free to sit there. And what is the hurry to go and do anything? But I was enjoying myself doing that one day, and this nagging little thought began to play in the back of my conscience. Okay, this nagging little guilt trip or arrow from the devil or whatever you want to put it as. And the question went like this. Okay, is this what God wants you to be doing with your time today? How many of you have ever seriously focused in on that question? I confess I had not. Does God have a say what I do with my time? Does God much care what I do with my time? Does God have an eternal agenda laid out for me? Or is God pretty much left me to do what I want to do? And I thought to myself, I'm going to do a little scratching around in scriptures and I'm going to see what I might find about what God says about what I should do or should not do with my day. So are you ready? All right, we're going to have a little interactive discussion here because I'm lazy. I don't just give stand-up sermons without audience participation anymore. All right. I want all of you mentally, and you can go there if you want, but you're so familiar with the story, there's really no sense going there. I want you to think about the Garden of Eden, okay, about the creation account. Now, you remember how the story goes. I'm just going to paraphrase here about how there was this creation week. And we got down to the, you know, the sixth day when God said, let's make man in our image. So he created mankind as male and female, and he put them in a garden. And what did he tell them they needed to do with their time? Dress and keep the garden. We're going to get back to that. And what else? 
Well, there's that. That's a part of the garden. But what else? Oh, there was that, but that's a negative. That's not what to do. Come on. Before the dressing and... Thank you. Be fruitful and multiply. All right. So we're going to be fruitful and multiply. Now, um, how much time during your day does that take? Well, at any rate, we'll let that comment go. We, we don't need to embellish on that anymore. All right? Now, this garden that they were to dress and keep, let's think about this garden for just a moment. Have you ever heard the term, uh, let nature take its course or we'll turn it back over to nature? And generally that's a phrase that's used after man has made a mess of something. You know, torn it all up, ripped it apart, polluted it, whatever. Well, if we can just let nature run its course, it will go back to its natural state and nature pretty much jolly well takes care of itself, doesn't it? God designed it that way. So if Adam didn't do anything in that garden to dress and keep anything, would it have made a whole lot of difference? Yeah, God planted it, set it there, and so on. Now, here's the way I read the instruction where he said to dress and keep the garden. I get the impression that God was saying to Adam, Okay, Adam, I put you in the middle of this beautiful garden. Now, what do you want to do with it? I've given you all these animals. What do you want to name them? And Adam had the choice to be able to decide what he wanted to do, what he wanted to plant or replant or move or do this or do that, whatever the term dress and keep involves, and Adam had the discretion to do that. Do you think God micromanaged every move he made? I don't either. I think God pretty much gave him free choice to do what he wanted. Now, how many of you, just out of curiosity, have any kind of a garden where you live? Any kind of a garden? All right, well, that's part of your garden, all right? Let me briefly describe what my garden and how it has evolved. You'll, you'll, I think you'll like this story. If you went out the back door of my house, first of all, we have a kind of a all-weather sun porch with windows on three sides, totally insulated and everything. You can be out there winter or summer. But you go through that, and we have a, a fence, that separates us at the back and the two sides from the neighbors, okay? Now, on the two sides with the fence, there are these two massive walls of oleander. All of you know what oleander is? I'm sure it can grow into a rather substantial bush. You know, it's down the median strip in many places, an 80 in the 99 highway and so on. And it really can get up there 12, 15 feet high if you let it go. Now, I have three massive pine trees, two in the back on either corner of the yard and one over on the south side of the house. And I'm glad it's on the south side of the house because the track, the sun tracks that way and it keeps my house in shade and really keeps down my air conditioning bill. Now, earlier on years ago, I had a bee in my bonnet that I ought to use all this land back here to do something productive. So I had about five different kinds of fruit trees. I had a vineyard. Uh, I mean, to tell you what, I had my garden planted and all the rest and so on and so forth. And I was doing big time back there. But you see, I ran into a little difficulty. First of all, these pine trees blocked out all the sunlight. And not much grew in the form of vegetables. Now you grow some flowers because there are a lot of flowers that are shade tolerant. So you could do a few flowers but the fruit really did not set that well or produce that much. And then I found out another hard fact of life that maybe you've heard me comment on in earlier sermons from years ago, is there's a creature in my backyard called a squirrel who loved, who loved to eat my fruit before I could get to it. And you know what I came to? I said to myself, this is a waste of time. I'm going to dress and keep my garden entirely differently. I'm first of all going to tear it all out. Tore out all the fruit trees, forgot the garden patch, 
And I harvested, I do this every year, I harvest all the pine needles that fall in my yard and on my roof and so on and so forth. And I'm not exaggerating in one whit. I raked off of my roof last year 14 wheelbarrows of pine needles. And I distribute these all over my backyard. The whole backyard, other than the patio block, is covered in pine needles. Now, this suits me very fine in my retirement because I sit down in my easy chair and I fold my hands and I say, this is wonderful. I have nothing to do. Because pine needles take no maintenance. Neither does oleander and neither do pine trees. And I say to myself, this is wonderful. Now, do you think God cares what I did? I think God made me a steward of my garden, just like he made Adam and Eve a steward of their garden. Okay, so if you're going to have a garden, it's kind of up to you. What am I going to do with this garden? Am, am, am I going to am I going to really try to make a big elaborate garden? Now, most of you have probably been over to the Smith's house, right, in Vacaville. Now, there's somebody that's trying to garden seriously. I mean, they got garden and they got compost piles and they got boxes and they got fruit trees and they got this and that and one thing and another. I mean, I love to share their produce, don't get me wrong, but I would not want to do all that work. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. All right, but that's his choice, right? He and his wife, if that's what they want to do with their garden, that's fine. Now, the point I'm, I'm trying to make here even where it says be fruitful and multiply, you know, God does give human beings a little bit of, of choice on just exactly how much fruitful and multiply they're going to do. You know, there is something we call birth control that one can exercise to limit the production. Now, with Adam and Eve, of course, it's a little different. We're looking for an unlimited supply here because uh, we need to replenish this whole earth. This place hasn't got any other human beings on it little different story there but you know as well as I do for all of you who have had children every child brings with it a responsibility and you know what children do they rob you of your freedom of what you're going to do with your time because children to a large degree dictate for you what you're going to do with your time you're going to get up in the middle of the night and feed me. You're going to change my diapers. You're going to clean up my messes. You're going to have to spend time disciplining me so I turn out to be something other than a wild creature. See, you're going to have to teach me and love me and listen to me and help me. And the more kids you have, the more restricted your time comes. And, and you don't say, what am I going to do today? You're going to say, where am I going to find the time, Lord, to do it? And still find some time to get some sleep, much less take a nap. You know, what's a nap when you've got little kids? Okay, so if you've been down that road, you, you know whereof I speak. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you a few things here early on because we have choices. How we're going to dress and keep our garden. What the size of our family is going to look like. We, we have things that are going to impinge on our time and the more we do. Now, God tells us there are certain things we should not do with our time. That is illustrated very well when he said, don't go over there and take from that tree of good and evil. That is what you don't want to do. For Adam and Eve, that was sin. That was missing the mark. And I think the message throughout the Bible has been consistent. God says, stay away from sin. It's going to cause you nothing but trouble. And then you're not going to have to worry about what you're going to do with your time. In fact, as I was coming across 80 here, and I noticed a sign that said the Vacaville Correctional Medical Facility. I used to visit a person over from the Sacramento area that was in Vacaville. And I, I hate going to prisons from the point of view, as I mean, you just feel stripped down and naked. I mean, you got no control over this at all. I mean, from the time you run through that front gate and they start asking you to empty your pockets and putting you through the metal detector and setting the rules and tell you where you're going to sit and how long this visit's going to last and what you can say and what not and where they want your hands to be, you just have lost your freedom. They're going to tell you what to do with your day. So God's saying, don't sin. You might end up in a place like that. 
and you don't want to do that. Or you might even form your own personal jail, even if you're not in a real one, because you've made mistakes, and those mistakes have had consequences, and maybe they've affected your health. They've affected your peace of mind. And we all know, don't we, that even if you didn't make any mistakes, if your kids, your grandkids, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, and all those people make mistakes, guess who they're going to drag into it? You and me. Right. And we get pulled into the dysfunction, right? So God, in that first account of the Garden of Eden, believe it or not, laid down all kinds of things about what we're going to do, perhaps, to spend our time doing and things we should not be doing with our time. But, but he doesn't micromanage, does he? he? He leaves parameters. There are going to be different choices. Now, I want to take you to an account in the book of Mark, and this was the basis of our scripture reading today. We're going to go there. And I, I really have learned a lot from this story, and we're going to look it over here. Now, it's already been read for you, so I, I'm just going to comment on some of the high points. This is, again, from Mark chapter 14, and it's about this experience that Christ had where he was eating in the house of a man named Simon who was a leper, and I take it this was a man that Christ had previously healed, because I'm sure that's the reason he didn't have leprosy anymore. Well, at any rate, he's eating there. I'm sure Simon was very thankful for Jesus to come and break bread with him because he really owed Christ a lot for having taken away his leprosy. And there's this woman who came in. Now, this woman, if we read the parallel account in the book of John, you may be familiar with two sisters and a brother. There was Mary, and there was Martha, and there was a brother named Lazarus. Now remember, Lazarus was the one who was already five days dead in the tomb when Christ resurrected him and commanded him to come out of the tomb. So this family was well acquainted with Jesus. You remember Martha was the one we kind of give a hard time because she was always hurrying around trying to serve the food and get things clean and was mad at Mar uh, Mary because all Mary wanted to do was sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to him. And Martha was trying to get her to do something and Christ had to keep, I think, getting after Martha, you know, to... Uh, just go a little easier on your sister. All right. So Mary, Jesus is in the house. They're eating. And Mary undoubtedly had heard Jesus say, as he had many times to this point, that he was going to die. As a matter of fact, in Mark 14, we're already down to the place of the last week that Jesus is alive on planet Earth. And they're going to take him away to crucify him very shortly after this event we're reading about. So Mary, with this in mind, know he's going to be killed, know he's going to be put in a tomb. She takes this expensive jar of, of nard, a type of, a, of an ointment and a perfume, in a very expensive jar, apparently busts the top off of it, and pours it all over Christ. And then, as John's account, apparently as it came down, maybe have even saved a little extra, she took her hair and kind of washed his feet with the nard. Now, to Mary, this was the greatest act of worship she could think to do. But to the people around, they were scandalized that anybody would waste that much precious ointment. And if you weren't going to use it on yourself, then at least sell it and give an offering to help the poor. But Jesus said, and here's the main point I'm drawing from here. Jesus said to her, leave her alone. And then this phrase, she did what she could. Now, that's something I'd like you to focus on because it goes back to the question, what are you going to do with your time? Because see, you and I have choices to make. And one of the choices we're going to have to make and one of the things we're going to have to consider in those choices is, well, what can I do? Because there's a lot of things we can't do. We don't have the health, the time, the strength, the resources, the proximity, whatever it may be. We just simply are not capable of doing certain things. But there's a whole bunch of other things we could do. So have you ever sat down based on the scripture and seriously meditated? 
maybe had a little session with you and the Lord and saying, Lord, in my circumstances, what could I do? Now, let's stop right there. What could you do for what purpose? What, what, what have you got in mind? When we say, well, Lord, what could I do? What generally is behind this? What is the type of thing we're thinking that maybe we should do? Something to serve God? Something to help other people? Um, help the poor? Provide transportation for a shut-in? Uh, go help a widow do her yard and work and mow her lawn? Well, the homeless too? Maybe your own kids and grandkids and family. But is that all? Is, is our whole life just to be bound up in serving other people, many of whom probably brought their circumstances on themselves? Is there no freedom here? Dan? Yeah. All right. Now that probably is stated. What can I do about some circumstance you find yourself in? And that's also a good question. But you see, the question to me, what could I do? Yes, definitely. I could think of people I could serve and help. I could think of ways to serve and help in my local church. I could think of ways to serve and help in my neighborhood. And I think when you look at the example of Christ, who remember Christ said of himself, I have come to be a servant of all. I did not come to be served. And if we're going to walk in his footsteps, certainly part of what we're going to choose to do, what shall I do today, probably ought to be taken up with service. But now, I believe, and I believe this passionately, and I'm going to give you an example to illustrate it in just a moment, that God also put us on this earth he gave us a certain period of time of which none of us knows how long it's going to last. And he literally wanted us to enjoy it. Now, unfortunately, some parts of Christianity, in fact, is many parts of Christianity, have not been very big on the fact that God put us here to enjoy it. They have been very austere and very regimented. And everything is connected with the church and serving the poor and doing this and doing that. And oh, if you get very involved in doing something that much fun, that might be the devil's workshop. Well, let me tell you what I did Thursday night. You know what I did Thursday night? I got involved with a card game of which there was money on the table. Now, let me explain. No, I was not at some casino. There's some widows over in a mobile home park just around the corner from me and Thursday night is bridge night and we get together and we play bridge and we put a little money together and if you get first place you get this and if you get second place you get this and if you get third place you get this and we have this this pot that we all contribute to and if some partnership bids and makes a grand slam which is the real coup d'etat in the game of bridge then you and your partner get to split whatever the accumulated pot is. And the last time somebody won this, myself and my partner split $150. All right. But I enjoy myself. We talk. We banter. We have fun. We spend about two and a half hours together on a Thursday night. And I say to myself, I only walk planet Earth one time, and I'm going to enjoy it. Now, I want to tell you something else. You might say, I told you my wife was gone, I think, went back to Pennsylvania. She won't be back a week from Monday. Well, I have a little ritual that I do. I love to get out in God's creation from time to time, and I take various places that I like to go. Well, I'm going to revisit one of my favorite haunts, which is over on the back side of the Sierra Nevada mountains along uh, State Highway 395. You know, 395 starts up around Reno, and it runs all the way south. And nearly, you could probably take it to L.A. But it runs right along the backside on the east side of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And there are just some of the most beautiful things back there to see and do. So, I'm leaving bright and early Monday morning. And I have various things that I'm planning to do for four days. Now, this time, I'm going to get lazy. I am not going to camp. Because times before I pitched a tent and I camped and I cooked my food and did all that other stuff. This time I'm going to get lazy. 
I found a cheap motel in a place called Lee Vining, which I'm going to use as my base of operation. And I'm going to live in a motel room and have a hot shower and a comfortable bed and a place to shave in the morning and all that kind of stuff. And I ain't going to go Spartan. I'm too old for that anymore. But I got all kinds of things I want to see and do. Hikes I want to take. Beautiful things I want to do. But now somebody was going to say, well, should you be doing that with your time? Well, um, yes, uh, I think God gave me so much time on planet Earth and I plan to use it. I got the time. I've saved a little money. I got a car to get me there. So what's holding me up? Nothing, I hope. However, I'll tell you a real quick story. My wife and I went on a little trip over to the coast, a place called Cambria. So it's north of San Luis Obispo as you head up toward Monterey. Beautiful area over there. And so we had a number of days we were going to spend over there. We got to the town of San Luis Obispo. We stayed with some friends there. And as we were leaving in town, I bought this brand new car out here, by the way, saved money for it, got a brand new Toyota Corolla, 2,500 miles on it. As I'm leaving San Luis Obispo, the transmission seizes up in neutral, will not shift into a gear, and the transmission is fried. And I had to be towed back to the Toyota dealership in San Luis Obispo. Fortunately, they gave me a free rental car, so it didn't hold us up from doing what we wanted to do. But our little stay was extended an extra day while they got a brand new transmission to put in my car. All under warranty didn't cost me anything, but I thought to myself, you know, you can lay a lot of plans, but when you're alongside the road waiting for AAA to come <laughs> tow you somewhere, maybe your plans just didn't work out the way you wanted them to, all right? All right. But... My point is, again and again and again, do what you can do. Yes, have acts of service. Look around. Help your family. We know the Bible talks about all those things. But I am telling you, God puts you in a garden to dress it and to keep it. And that involves a lot of free choice on your part to make this just the way you want to do it. Now, maybe the little vacation trip I planned doesn't much appeal to you. You might have something else in mind. That's wonderful. That's what God gave you free choice to decide. So you go enjoy your thing and I'll go enjoy my thing. My wife is having a marvelous time with her three sisters back in Pennsylvania. And they're playing games, laughing, howling, visiting various relatives, got a big family reunion plan, going to see scenic spots and all the rest, staying up to all hours of the night because they don't have to get up in the early and part of the morning. And, you know, they're just having a grand time. That's what she likes to do every year. I do not like to be around our relatives for 11 days. <laughs> Anybody's relatives, either hers or mine, would wear me out long before 11 days ever came through, okay? So you go, honey. You just go. Now, when it's her turn to host the sisters, then I become the chief bottle washer and chauffeur and cook and everything else, and I am their servant, and they are the masters, and I go where they tell me to go for 11 days. <laughs> but this ain't our turn for California. We're in Pennsylvania. Goodbye, dear. I'll talk to you later. And so, I want to take you to one more quick place, and then we're going to quit. Back to a commission that you're all familiar with. Just one thing I want to bring out here that I found interesting. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, I think all of you are well familiar with this, where Christ gives this commission to the church. That includes you and me. Because this was directed to his disciples. And he said, therefore, you go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Teach them to obey all the commands, and I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now, how many of you feel that involves you? Individually. As one of those disciples who should, as a part of your day, be thinking about, how can I spread the good news? Now, you don't like to much think about that, and neither do I like to much think about that, because I love the Lord. I love my faith. I will talk to anybody about my faith. But as far as being somewhat proactive, uh, some people have a gift for evangelism, and then some people like me, and you think, you've been a minister for 50 years, and you, you know, well, I you know what it was like in this church for 50 years? You were told what to do and how to evangelize, and somebody else did it for you most of the time. Anyway, 
But there was something about this that was pointed out to me one time that I found fascinating. Because what, if you gave the, uh, the verse here the way it was properly interpreted in the Greek, in verse 19 where it says, therefore go and make disciples, the verse would be translated like this. Therefore, as you were going along in your daily routine, make disciples. Okay, now think about this for a moment. As you were going along in your daily routine, it, it is the, the uh, uh, what do we call that tense? Uh, present progressive, I believe. What you're doing progressively is you're going along in the present. And the thought in mind, all of us know we're supposed to be a light to the world, right? Now, there was a wise minister one time named St. Francis of Assisi. And St. Francis of Assisi made this statement. He said, preach the gospel by any means and use words if necessary. Did you hear that? Use words if necessary. Well, how do you preach if you're not going to use words? You preach by your example. You preach by exposing yourself to other people as you go along in your daily routine. And they ought to see something in you that maybe in this kind of hopeless mess that we live in in this world around us, they might see a ray of something that might give them some hope or some inspiration in your life with your faith, with a smile on your face, which I hope is there, and they might inquire. And you know what? If you seriously be prayed to God and said, God, as I am going along my way, you know there may be people you want to be exposed to your truth, and Lord God, I would feel myself privileged if you would use me and set up an opportunity, and here I am, Lord. Now, can you do that? See? So we're asking, what can I do with my day? Well, I think we ought to at least be cognizant of the fact that as we're going along, that maybe God will provide us an opportunity through our example, through our light, and maybe when we're even, you know, called upon, as Peter said, to give an account for the faith and the hope that lies within us, we can certainly be prepared to do that. So let's go all the way back to the beginning question again. I'm retired now. So what do you do with your time, they say? Well, I do some things I want to do. I do some things God wants me to do. I do some things with my family. I do some things in my neighborhood. I just do all kinds of things. And yes, like a lot of retired people, I say, where am I going to get the time to do all these things that I want to try to do? And I know if, you know, if you're retired now, don't get me wrong. I take time to take a nap every afternoon. Don't call me between one and three, please. I don't want to be bothered between one and three. I want to be left alone. I want to take my nap. It's my right. I'm retired. I can take naps if I want to. I take my walk every morning. Generally out there for about an hour, six days a week. Fact is, I even had time this morning to take a walk. So I did, because my wife wasn't around. I didn't have to worry about doing things she might have in mind. I wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning anyway. May as well do something. So I did. All right. By giving you some food for thought, I'm giving you a couple, three scriptural examples. So my basic point to you is this. Think about it. Take it to God and say to God, well, Lord, what should I do today? But realize this. God isn't going to, you know, give you a hundred, you know, point list of do's and don'ts. But I think there's a few scriptural examples that he might ask you to think about and what it is that you should be doing today. I hope I've given you some food for thought. Shall we pray? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. 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 Same thing. Right. All right. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you again for the time spent together today. We certainly know that you have called us. We love you for that, Lord. You've given us a part of your great plan of salvation. 
You have saved us through the blood of our, our, our Savior, Jesus. And now, Lord, I hope all of us can just kind of make it a part of our daily prayers to you. Well, Lord, here I am. You know, it's like Isaiah said, here I am, Lord, send me. You know, I'll help out. I'll do what I can. But also, Father, not to feel like life is a burden, but realize that you gave us time to dress and keep a garden, to enjoy our lives, to fellowship with others. And Father in heaven above, help us spend our time in appreciation of those things that you give to us. We ask your blessing on us as we go now, Lord, and thank you for all you do. In Christ's name, amen. Feeling the blues today or tired of life already? Do you have questions about life or need spiritual advice? The Worldwide Church of God is located in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto, California. We welcome everyone to attend our worship services with us every week at the times listed on your screen.